by Jennifer Egan for a talk about her latest novel, Manhattan Beach. Welcome to you. Thank you. So, um, first thing that hit me is, is likely, and, and you and I last talked for a visit from the Goon Squad, and I thought readers who knew that might not have expected historical fiction. Were you expecting that? Was it a surprise to you? Uh, I knew it would be historical fiction because I've actually been researching this book since 2005. And and to some degree, my Goon Squad actually grew out of the research I did for this book in some ways. Partly my interest in the passage of time, which came from interviewing a lot of people in their 80s huh. who were reminiscing about events that I knew I would be using in this book. So so this one came first in the sense, and I mean... I knew I was interested in writing about New York during World War II. I knew yeah. that. Why? And, well, tell me why. Well, I think that really started with 9-11 and, ha and experiencing the New York becoming basically a war zone overnight yeah. and wondering what it was like during the war when there was such a fear of a, of a sea or an air invasion. Uh, and, and so thinking about the, the port of New York during World War II yeah. led me to the Brooklyn Navy Yard, which was the largest builder and repairer of Allied ships during yeah. the war. Um, and that led to an oral history project in which I ended up interviewing a lot of people who worked at the Navy Yard during the war, especially women. Yeah. So it was a lot of people toward the end of their lives reminiscing about their youths. And I think a lot of that put me in, in mind of time and just yeah. the narrative of a life. And that's a lot of what Goon Squad ended up yeah, being yeah, about. Yeah. But the whole time I knew that I was eventually going to get to my book, which I always hoped would be sort of a noirish thriller. Your book, your other book. Yeah, your, yeah exactly. Yeah. The, the, the fiction as opposed to just the research. So you always knew it would be a what? A noirish I, thriller? I as hoped well it as... would be a noirish thriller. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh. I, I, I mean, I love that kind of urban, bleak feeling of noir films and also cheesy detective novels. Um, and I hoped that I could sort of use that and fuse it with a sea story uh -huh. and also a story about uh, organized crime, which was another big feature of the waterfront right, um, right. during the war and after. Right. Um, and also the story about, about women and, and the ways in which they were asked to discover strengths that they didn't know they had during yeah. the war do, doing industrial work. So yeah. all of that together, um, but it's a strange thing about the way I write fiction that even though I had been researching for five, um, even five to seven years before I started writing, yeah. I still had no idea what the story would be. So then I continued oh, to really? research. So, well, that's what I was wondering. So the oral history project, you're getting out the stories of these people, especially women. Mm -hmm. What happens, but it doesn't end up telling you what the story should be that you're then going to write? Not directly. Mm -hmm. I mean, the way I write fiction is that I write by hand in a very impulsive, blind way. And you my do. goal, yes, my goal is to be surprised by what happens. But of course, having in my mind all, uh, memories of so many conversations and little details, yeah. that becomes almost like a sort of memory pool to draw on as I'm as I'm kind of rushing forward in into creating these characters in in a fairly instinctive way so i mean without the notes from those interviews i might have glanced at them but really it was more I, I i would say by then i had sort of integrated a lot of them into a kind of vague general sense of memories without yeah. even an idea of which particular woman they attached to which was helpful because in a way at a certain point one has to move away from the research to be able to really move around and make the material yeah. one's own so but so some writers know where they're trying to get to you don't not really no i don't really start with a grand design yeah. after i have a first draft which in the case of this book meant 1400 handwritten pages <laughs> oh really yep then i type it and read on it on behalf of readers everywhere we're glad you got it <laughs> down i guess right? right you don't even know how glad oh, the publisher, you are your publisher yeah right right <laughs> um but then i type it and i read it and then i make a very careful and yeah. analytical outline so it's not that i'm never with a plan it's just that for me the plan begins one step later yeah so, well, we're talking around the book. Let's just help people understand a little bit about the story itself. There's a main character, Anna Kerrigan, right? Her father and a, a gangster. And this is all 1930s, 40s, and... 
Yeah, I mean, they their paths first cross. Anna is a child, and her father brings her to visit this sort of underworld figure named yeah. Dexter Styles. It's clear that he and the father have some business together. And then at a later, we, we resume the narrative a few years later, and Anna's father has disappeared, apparently having abandoned the family, as a lot of men did during the Depression. Mm -hmm. She's now 19 and uh, ends up working at the Brooklyn Navy Yard, um, and the Second World War has, has begun. It's fairly early in the American involvement in the war. Mm -hmm. She um, does not know where her father has gone or why, but by chance, she crosses paths again with Dexter Styles, this uh, sort of crime boss yeah. and nightclub impresario. And she makes his acquaintance without his knowing what their actual connection is. From so in, a certain, yeah. in a certain sense, she's undercover. Yeah. And, and, and of course, this is a, you live in New York, but this is a very different New York. Yes. It, it, well, it, the same and different. Of yeah, course, some of yeah. the structures are still there, but it was a little more rough and ready in certain yeah, ways. And yeah. certainly the, the corruption of the waterfront, which was immortalized in the movie On the Waterfront, yeah, of course. was, uh, was I, I think that no longer exists. Um, but it was a very, it was a time of a lot of movement and tumult, both in New York and in the country, yeah. which is always interesting from a novelist's point of view, because things become possible that wouldn't have been otherwise. Yeah. You know, women and African Americans were doing jobs they'd been right. told they couldn't do. Right. People were physically moving around a lot. It was part of a huge migration to the West Coast, yeah. which ultimately led to the tech boom. So lots of lots of movement, which is very dramatic or has the potential to be. And, and it, we should say this: your character Anna, your character becomes a diver, right? Which is not the kind of thing she would have been able to do without the war, I suppose. No, so. and and. Honestly, I'm not sure any women dove at the Brooklyn Navy Yard. I should just say oh, that, that part you made up. Well, I I, I, yeah. I don't know that it didn't happen. Oh, okay. okay. Um, but what one thing I found in my research about the Brooklyn Navy Yard was that diving was actually an important part of ship repair, which is something I hadn't known. Right. And so I did, I, as part of my research, I fell in with some army veteran divers and got to know them and even interviewed one who had dived during the Second World War in Cherbourg, helping to clear out the harbor. Mm -hmm. He had met a female diver in Cherbourg who was Russian. Um, so that was sort of all the license I needed. Yeah. Um, and yeah. uh, so, yes, yeah, so Anna becomes a civilian diver. It was dangerous work and therefore yeah. the pay was higher. Um, and uh, and she gets to walk along on the bottom of the harbor. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, you mentioned uh, noir films and On the Waterfront. So you like films. I mean, do these... Do these did you ever write for write for movies or want no, to write? No, no, not at all. I'm interested in films to the degree to which they can I can use them for fiction. But I feel like my I've really planted my flag in in the novel, and yeah. so I'm I, I'm interested more. I love using genres that we might find elsewhere. For example, one of my influences in A Visit from the Goon Squad was The Sopranos. Right. That that kind of serialized approach to structure. Here, I was thinking about sea survival stories. And the noir, yeah. um, and which are very different from each other, and yet they have a lot in common. The stakes are always very high in both those genres. Yeah. We, there's a there's a tremendous threat. Um, we know there's danger, and survival is always on the table, and yet one is in, in, in the natural world, and the other is very urban and bleak. Is the, is the influence direct, though? I mean, if you're watching The Sopranos at a certain point, like we all you know, many people watch that, you start to think about how it's structured and how you might structure a, a novel? Almost that way. I, what I would do, what I did with The Sopranos is I would say, why? what makes this so interesting? Why mm. is this storytelling so compelling? Ah. And so I would isolate some elements like the polyphonic structure, the broad canvas, yeah. the you know lots of different characters. Characters who come in and out. Exactly. And, yeah. and then at a later point, I find myself bringing that into the fiction, but it is not quite so... Uh, strategic in the moment just because, again, I'm so instinctive. You know, I haven't asked anybody else this in the past two days, but I was so taken by the epigraph from Herman Melville, which is from Moby Dick. Yes, as everyone knows, meditation and water are wedded forever. Now, 
What, where did, <laughs> well, first what is, of all, I mean, why? if you're interested in sea stories, yeah, of you course, know, I get Dick, that. I get absolutely that, yeah. one of the greatest American novels for yeah. sure. And Melville yeah. lived in New York and describes the New York waterfront. Yeah. Um, but also, you know, one aspect of this book, without, it's a little hard to, I don't want to give things away, right. but there is one character who ends up at sea, a ver someone who's struggled tremendously in his life. Right. And he finds a certain piece, a kind of, um, almost a sort of transcendence through the actual contemplation of the sea, this feeling of actually being surrounded by the sea. And that, I have to say, that's something I really relate to. Yeah. Um, and I think in a way, this book was a chance for me to look at the sea from every angle. I mean, we have divers under the sea. We have all this waterfront shore life and shipbuilding. Right. And then there is this aspect of the story in which it's there's a, a you know someone surrounded by the sea for weeks and weeks. It is interesting, though. I mean, in New York and many other American cities, how that used to be ports, how they lost that that looking out to sea, right? Very much Many so. of us live in cities where we barely ever go to the waterfront, but a lot of them are being rediscovered and rebuilt. That's so true, and that's yeah. definitely happening in New York. But yeah. I got interested in New York during World War II, and I started looking at images of the city, and yeah. I was startled by the dominance of water in the images. It yeah. was so clear that that was really part of the city. Yeah. And I had lived in New York since 1987, and I think I'd taken one ride on the Circle Line, and I liked to run along the rivers, but that was my experience of the waterfront. So. Yeah remembering that the port of New York was a crucial place yeah. before and during World War II. I mean, most of the East Coast convoys left through the port of New York. Right. All right, just a couple of minutes. So I just want to ask you a couple of things. One is you, you don't write a lot of, you don't publish a lot of novels, right? This is the first in quite a while. Uh, yes, well, it's been seven years between yeah. Goon Squad and this one. Yeah. I, so, I, I hope it will never happen again. Yeah, but why, well, so why is that? Is that... Uh, well, I think part of it was Goon Squad had such good luck, frankly, and I wanted to really capitalize on that because I've been doing this long enough that I knew it wouldn't happen twice. Good luck as in, you know, hitting a lot of people and getting prizes and things like that. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. So I did spend a lot of time trying to connect with readers with that book. And also, it took longer to for me to get comfortable in another historical context than I expected. Mm -hmm. And I think the reason for that is I thought it would just be a matter of knowing what people wore and did at a specific time. But what I was forgetting was that we all bring to the present our own past mm -hmm. individually and collectively. So to really write about a time, you have to know what came well before it so mm -hmm. that you know what people are bringing to it. Yeah. So that research took a lot longer than I thought. So next time you decide to do what? Not go well, back to... Uh... When I worked on my first draft of this book, I, was, I started a first draft of another book. Ah. So I hope, which I think, I hope will be a companion to Goon Squad, actually. Because oh. I'm ready to get back to the present day and the future now. It's an interesting cycle for you from... Boom, you're sort of hopscotching yourself, I guess. Huh? I love to work against what I've just done. Yeah. I mean, partly it's just wanting a change yeah. um, and not wanting to get too comfortable in any particular mode. But um, but yes, I hope that that will happen and I hope it won't be so long. <laughs> okay, new novel is Manhattan Beach, Jennifer Egan. Thank you very much. Thank you. And do stay with us here at the Miami Book Fair. I'm Jeffrey Brown from the PBS NewsHour. We will be right back.